Total shoulder arthroplasty is now performed with increasing frequency. In the United States, the incidence of total shoulder arthroplasty has increased from 6.1 per 100,000 patients to 13.4 per 100,000 patients within eight years. As technology has evolved, so has the procedure. This includes the utilization of modular components that allow reproduction of the individual patient's anatomy and the use of intraoperative computer-based guidance for accurate implantation of the components. Based upon a preliminary CT, a three-dimensional reconstruction of the glenoid is created, enabling the surgeon to evaluate the glenoid structure, specifically glenoid erosion and subsequent version, to appreciate the compatibility of the desired glenoid implant and the potential penetration of the glenoid cage, pegs, or cement through the glenoid vault cortex. Using intraoperative computer-assisted navigation, assists in determination of the entry point at the surface of the glenoid to allow accurate reaming, resulting in a better version of the glenoid as well as a lower range of error for implant insertion, specifically for version and inclination. The disadvantages of this technique would be a slightly increased operative time, which is dedicated to installing the sensor and purchasing the reference points with the tracker on the glenoid. Furthermore, the clinical significance of this enhanced accuracy has yet to be of proven efficacy. Total shoulder arthroplasty is performed primarily for patients with glenohumeral arthritis. The etiology of glenohumeral arthritis can be quite variable and includes osteoarthritis, various types of inflammatory arthritis, post-traumatic arthritis, and osteonecrosis of the humeral head with secondary degenerative changes. These are a partial list of the more common indications for total shoulder arthroplasty. The decision to proceed with anatomic total shoulder arthroplasty versus reverse total shoulder arthroplasty is based on a careful assessment of multiple clinical and radiographic factors. In patients with glenohumeral arthritis and an intact, well-functioning rotator cuff, anatomic total shoulder arthroplasty is generally the procedure of choice. The key steps for this procedure include proper preoperative planning, setting up the operating room, including patient positioning, surgical exposure, accessing the glenohumeral joint, either by subscapularis tenotomy, subscapularis peel, or lesser tuberosity osteotomy, preparation of the humerus, exposure and preparation of the glenoid with component insertion, humeral component insertion with trial reduction to obtain the appropriate combination of stability and range of motion, humeral component implantation, subscapularis reattachment and closure. Proper postoperative immobilization and rehabilitation is essential to achieve an optimal outcome. For preoperative planning, it is important to review the preoperative imaging, including standard radiographs and CT scan. If there is a concern about the integrity of the rotator cuff tendons, we recommend performing an MRI. The glenoid wear pattern is assessed most clearly with a CT scan and appropriate 3D reconstructions. Using preoperative 3D navigation software, the appropriate glenoid implant type is selected and accurate position can be determined. In addition to controlling version and inclination of the component, the planning decreases the risk of perforation of the glenoid vault that would lead to perforating cement and or glenoid pegs. This patient is a 76-year-old female with a five-year history of progressively worsening left shoulder pain. She has been treated with different non-operative measures, including anti-inflammatory medication, two intraarticular steroid injections, as well as physical therapy. At the present time, she describes the pain level as a 10 out of 10. She has difficulty performing her everyday activities, including overhead lifting or pushing and pulling. It has become increasingly difficult to perform her simple activities of daily living. Standard radiographs of the left shoulder show advanced glenohumeral arthritis. There is complete loss of joint space, inferior humeral head osteophyte formation. However, the subacromial space is well maintained. The axillary view shows the humeral head to be reasonably well centered on the glenoid with no evidence of significant asymmetric glenoid erosion. CT scan confirms 
the glenoid anatomy with the absence of significant asymmetric erosion. In this patient, an MRI was also available which showed an intact rotator cuff. Preoperative planning was performed for this patient using GPS software. Using the preoperative planning software, we determined that we would utilize a medium-sized glenoid component. Placing the component in approximately three degrees of retroversion with zero degrees inclination provided the optimal position with respect to contact with the glenoid as well as removal of a minimal amount of bone. The patient is taken to the operating room where, after administration of either regional or general anesthesia, an evaluation under anesthesia of the shoulder is performed to assess passive range of motion. The operating table is placed in the beach chair position and secured while the torso is forward flexed at 30 degrees, and pillows are placed under the patient's buttock and thighs. The 3D navigation system is installed and the shoulder and upper extremity is then prepped and draped in a standard sterile manner. This is a view of the left shoulder. Lateral is on the right of the screen and superior is at the top of the screen. The coracoid process is marked as well as the deltoid insertion. Using an anterior deltopectoral incision, the skin and subcutaneous tissues are divided. Medial flaps are developed to expose the cephalic vein, which is enveloped within a fatty tissue stripe. For the left shoulder, the coracoid process is palpated in the left superior corner. The interval is developed proximally and distally with the cephalic vein usually retracted laterally with the deltoid. The subdeltoid and subacromial spaces are mobilized. This provides continuity between the subacromial and subdeltoid spaces. The pectoralis major muscle is mobilized next and released as necessary, usually up to one centimeter of its proximal attachment. The clavipectoral fascia is divided longitudinally up to the coracoacromial ligament and the conjoined tendon muscles are mobilized. The self-retaining cold bell retractor is used to retract the deltoid laterally and the pectoralis major and the conjoined tendon medially. This exposes the deeper tissues. The biceps tendon is palpated within the bicipital groove and exposed. Number two, non-absorbable braided sutures are then passed through the tendon and through the soft tissue adjacent to the distal portion of the groove and to the pectoralis major tendon. The sutures are tied to securely complete the tenodesis. The biceps tendon is then divided just proximal to the tenodesis. It is dissected and visualized up to the rotator interval and excised. The subscapularis insertion into the lesser tuberosity is identified along with the rotator interval. The subscapularis tendon and associated capsule are divided one centimeter medial to its insertion into the lesser tuberosity to allow adequate tendon laterally for later repair. The edge of the subscapularis tendon is tagged with number two non-absorbable braided sutures. The rotator interval is then divided to the anterior superior glenoid. The humerus is externally rotated and the capsule is detached from the anterior inferior aspect of the humeral neck to the posterior inferior corner. This allows the humerus to be externally rotated to 90 degrees. At this point, the entire articular surface of the humeral head is visualized. The peripheral osteophytes are removed with the rangeur. The location of the humeral neck osteotomy is determined based upon the anatomic landmarks. The humeral neck osteotomy is performed using the angled cutting guide. The angle of the resection is first marked using the electrocautery. Since the mean humeral head retroversion is 25 degrees, the osteotomy is performed to maintain approximately 25 degrees of retroversion. The resected portion of the humeral head is removed and inspected. Due to the humeral head retroversion variability, the anatomic retroversion is assessed 
and correct it accordingly if necessary. With our experience, this method is quicker and more efficient than the standard head dislocation prior to performing the neck cut. The proximal humerus is translated anteriorly and placed in extension and external rotation. Posterior osteophytes are removed with a rangeur. The starting reamer is then inserted into the canal, followed by the first brooch, which is inserted for centering. Sequential broaching is then performed, progressing up to the final brooch, which should fit securely without gross motion when rotated. The brooch is removed, and the final prosthetic stem is impacted into place to obtain a secure interference fit. Exposure of the glenoid requires circumferential release of the capsule and placement of retractors. The proximal humerus is retracted posteriorly and the flat posterior glenoid retractor is placed. This provides a limited release of the posterior capsule. The anterior capsule is released from the glenoid rim starting at the rotator interval and extending to the anterior inferior quadrant. The anterior retractor is placed along the anterior glenoid. A Homan retractor is placed superiorly. Attention is then turned to the intraarticular portion of the biceps tendon. It is detached from its insertion to the superior glenoid and removed. The remaining labrum is excised circumferentially. The inferior capsule is then detached from the glenoid rim using electrocautery. An elevator is then used to strip the capsule attachment medially to the triceps origin. With the glenoid exposed, the soft tissue at the base of the coracoid and the underside is removed to expose the bony surface. The anchor for the GPS tracker is then placed onto the superior aspect of the coracoid process so that there is a clear connection with the navigation device. It is secured in place by two screws. The GPS tracking device is then attached to the anchor. The data acquisition device is then used in combination with the GPS computer. Sequential acquisition of the data points is performed beginning with the coracoid and progressing to all data points. At this time, the first drill bit is used. The navigation is used to identify the starting point based upon preoperative planning, and the drill hole is made to the appropriate depth and angle. Reaming is then performed using GPS navigation to maintain the proper amount of version and inclination. In this case, reaming was done at three degrees of retroversion as planned preoperatively. The second guide with the central peg is then inserted. The superior hole is drilled and a peg is inserted to control rotation. This is followed by the anterior inferior hole and the posterior inferior hole. The guide is then removed. The trial component is used to confirm the size and position. In this case, the medium-sized glenoid was chosen. Since there is a mismatch between the glenoid and humeral head components, which is referred to as the radial mismatch, the glenoid components are provided with two available articular curvatures, named alpha and beta, so that these sized glenoid components can be matched with any size humeral head component which ranges from 38 millimeters to 53 millimeters, while at the same time obtaining an optimal radial mismatch of 5.5 millimeters. In this case, an alpha curvature glenoid was selected based upon the size of the removed humeral head in order to achieve the proper radial mismatch. The component for implantation is brought onto the field. Cancellous bone from the humeral head is used to fill the bone cage. The prepared glenoid is irrigated copiously and packed with thrombin-soaked gel foam. The packing is removed, 
the cement is injected into the prepared peripheral holes. The caged glenoid component is inserted and impacted into place. It should be fully seated with use of sequential impactors. Any excess cement is removed. Since the central bone cage provides an excellent initial interference press fit, waiting for cement hardening is not necessary, and final preparation of the humeral component can proceed. The proximal humerus is then translated anteriorly, and the humerus is placed in extension and external rotation. The cut surface of the proximal humerus is assessed. Based upon the location of the stem within the metaphysis and the amount of eccentricity, the appropriate replicator plate, either 1.5 millimeters or 4.5 millimeters of eccentricity, is chosen and secured with a screw. The trial humeral head rings are used to determine appropriate size. The replicator plate rotation instrument is used to determine the optimal position for the replicator plate and the humeral head. This system provides dual eccentricity to optimize metaphyseal coverage and reproduction of anatomy. Trial humeral heads are then utilized to determine the proper eccentric position of the humeral head component. Different humeral heads are trialed as necessary to obtain the optimal combination of range of motion and stability. Once the final humeral head size is determined, which in this case is a 41 millimeter tall component, the torque defining driver is used to secure the replicated plate in proper position. The modular humeral head is impacted onto the Morse taper in the proper position based upon the trial reductions. The humeral head is reduced onto the glenoid and the range of motion and stability is once again assessed. The subscapularis tenotomy is repaired with number two braided simple sutures. The rotator interval is also closed with the same sutures. The interval repair is performed to decrease the lateral tension on the subscapularis repair. When the repair is completed, external rotation is assessed to confirm the security of the repair and to direct postoperative rehabilitation. One gram of vancomycin powder is placed onto the subscapularis repair. If post-surgical bleeding is a concern, a drain is placed deep to the deltopectoral interval and brought out distally and laterally. The deltopectoral interval is tacked together with number zero absorbable suture in a locking, running closure. A second gram of vancomycin powder is placed on top of the deltopectoral interval repair. The subcutaneous tissue is closed with simple interrupted absorbable 2O sutures. The skin is closed with a running subcuticular closure with number 30 nylon suture. Steri strips are applied followed by a sterile dressing. The postoperative x-rays obtained in the operating room include an AP view with internal rotation, an AP view with external rotation, and an axillary view. These three views allow the surgeon to evaluate component position and alignment. These x-rays show the components to be in good position and alignment. On the axillary view, the humeral head is well centered on the glenoid component. Immediately after performing these x-rays, the patient's operated upper extremity is immobilized in a sling. Complications associated with anatomic total shoulder arthroplasty can be classified as intraoperative and postoperative. Intraoperative complications include the potential for humeral and glenoid fracture, during preparation and insertion of the components. Although both are very uncommon, it is more common for the humerus. Intraoperative neurovascular injury can occur because of the proximity of the neurovascular bundle, but this is also exceedingly uncommon. Other possible intraoperative complications are malposition and improper sizing of the glenoid or humeral head component. Early postoperative complications include infection, disruption of the subscapularis repair, and instability. Later postoperative complications can also include infection, component loosening, and rotator cuff failure from progressive degeneration. It is the surgeon's responsibility to minimize the risk of intraoperative complications and monitor the patients closely for the development of any postoperative complications. 
Following total shoulder arthroplasty, patients are expected to report improved functional outcomes, including the ASES, UCLA, and CONSTANT scores, significantly decreased pain as manifested in lower visual analog scores, as well as improved range of motion represented by improved forward elevation, external rotation, and internal rotation behind the back. Strength is also improved and is manifested by an improved ability to perform everyday activities. Postoperative immobilization and rehabilitation may vary based upon surgeon preference. However, there are basic principles that should be followed. Postoperative immobilization in a sling or similar orthosis is required to allow soft tissue healing, specifically allowing healing of the subscapularis reattachment. The duration of immobilization is variable, and our practice is to utilize a simple sling for immobilization for a period of five weeks. During this time, passive range of motion of the shoulder is allowed. Passive forward elevation is performed without limitation. Passive external rotation is limited to zero degrees. The patients can perform active range of motion of the elbow, wrist, and hand. Following a period of immobilization, an outpatient rehabilitation program is initiated under the supervision of the operating surgeon and the therapist. Active range of motion is performed combined with passive range of motion and stretching to increase the overall range. Strengthening begins with isometrics and progresses to resistive strengthening. In our experience, patients generally obtain 70% of their overall recovery at three months, but continue to improve for one year following the surgery.